Hello, everybody. Um, I'm Christian Hardenberg, CTO at Rocket Internet. Um, some of you might know this company. We went uh, to the stock market two weeks ago, and um, we are a company builder specialized on building internet companies. We have built 75 companies in the last seven years. We are now present in more than 100 countries with uh, in total 25,000 employees. So when I thought about this talk, I thought, what is Rocket speci especially good at? And it turns out I think we are pretty good at speed, at getting things done faster than others and getting more done than others. And I thought, let's share some learnings about how we speed up things, not only on the code side, on the website, but also on the organizational side. And why is speed important? I think, first of all, because if you're faster, you can overtake your, your competition and you can get more done in shorter time. But I think there's also one other thing which I like, especially as we are rocket. And uh, if you look at rocket science, you will find this formula, which is the, the exit velocity. So it's the, the speed you need to get out of the gravity field of the Earth. And I think if you ever start a company, there's a lot of gravity holding you back. Uh, it's, uh, lots of problems, doubts, issues, and just uh, maybe a problem to get out of bed in the morning. So speed can really help you to get out of this gravity field and rise up there to the stars. And I think that is what we try at Rocket to, to just by doing it fast, not worrying too much about all the problems on the side. So let's look at speed from different areas. Yeah? I th I, let's look at it really low level on code, um, then on how to speed up a website how to speed up a team, and finally, how to speed up a whole organization. Um, when we look at code, it is like everyone has a good opinion, uh, opinion how to, to, to build a fast, uh, fast code, how to do performance. There are so many ideas. The problem is it's dangerous, because these super smart guys there who have been around for 50 years or so, they warn us and they tell us, yeah, there are more sins done in the, committed in the name of efficiency than in any other single reason, including blind stupidity. So what you wonder is if it's so easy, yeah? <laughs> if it's, uh, everyone has a good opinion how to do things, why is it so dangerous? And I think the reason behind that is that many developers out here, including myself probably, don't have a good feeling for what is fast and what is slow. Um, and that leads to unguided optimization. And that leads to, and why is that? I mean, in the past I did 3D graphics, 100 million polygons in, a, in, a, in 10 milliseconds, that there you still have a good feeling for your hardware, but on web development, we are now, there's so, so many layers between us, our code, and the hardware, that it gets hard to get a feeling for what is fast. So I wanted to do a little test to see how this audience performs, and uh, so I took a really simple you know, database with a, we have the uh, 16 million products, and I joined that with uh, 32 million simples, 32 million uh, sources. So a typical thing you will see on your MySQL database. I have a MySQL database running here on my MacBook Air, so anyone would like to guess how long the first, you know, how long it takes to count, how long it takes to do this join? Anyone? Lars. <laughs> Who wants to guess? Come on. Yes, it's indexed, of course. Tell me, give just a number. Five Sorry, five seconds to count and, f and the join? Who? How much? Five. five seconds. OK, good. So let's test. Um, OK, let's count. And, and be aware, I, I, I cleared the caches. Yeah, it's not no query caches here. So let's count a bit. And you see it counts and it counts. I mean, it's a MacBook Air. It's not a server. Uh, it counts and counts and counts and counts. And there we go. Almost 10 seconds, 8.5. So very good. Good estimation, almost right. But now let's do this join. And there we go. 2.5 milliseconds. 2.5. And you estimated, I think, five seconds. So that's by the order of 1,000 wrong. Sorry. Yeah? And that's, again, exactly what I mean, that we have, don't have this feeling for how fast are things. It's not magic. It's not cached. It's really indexes are uh, speeding up MySQL quite amazingly. Um, so that was about databases. But the same is probably true about code. Yeah? Everybody knows these statistics that C++ is you know, 100 times faster than Ruby. And uh, 
and uh, Java is still, I mean, it's, it's amazing. 10 seconds for the same thing in C++ takes 11 minutes in Ruby or PHP. You can go in between to Java, go C Sharp, that's, that's quite acceptable. So again, a very sensible idea would be just change the programming language. But, yeah, fast languages are hard, especially C, and uh, nobody knows them, yeah? <laughs> if you take esoteric things like, like Scala and Golang. So it might be a solution, but uh, let's, before we jump there, um, see what we can do with PHP, what we are using at Rocket mostly. Of course, this is, you know, random statistics, don't take them too serious, but there's, just by changing the version of PHP, you can uh, yeah, get, get amazing performance improvements, or just by switching to Hip Hop Virtual Machine from Facebook, which we tried out on our, our, our browser, on our shop, uh, we suddenly had double the, the speed. Yeah? So there are options inside your existing language. Or you just switch the framework. Yeah? Most of the code is actually executed in Send or Symfony. So what we do at Rocket, we use Falcon, which is a framework for PHP, which is written in C. Um, obviously much faster, so the code you never change um, because it's framework code, that can be fast and optimized, so you can still use your existing code. That works quite well for us. Or you can just buy more servers. So this is real statistics currently, uh, 5,000 requests per minute on a, on a front-end node in a shop. So-so, yeah, it could be 10,000, but yeah, in, on PHP, when we, uh, we look at, uh, at companies like Zalando, which have a couple hundred thousand RPMs, that's still possible just to add a yeah, hundred front-end nodes and you're done. Could be much cheaper than rebuild your whole uh, front-end in Golang. But still, we could, of course, go to Golang, and, and we do it at Rocket, because we think for specific things it's a great language. We use it for tracking, for recommendations, things where you have a lot of requests and not so much logic. But I would never you know, switch my whole uh, shop system to Golang just because it's faster, because there are other options. And um, just to think, you know, how, how do we decide now what to do? Yeah? We see it's not easy. I think the, the trick is to do performance in a test-driven performance optimization, uh, not only development, but also optimization. You have to set up your goals. How much do you want to achieve? How many orders per minute or requests per minute or products on the side? And then you do realistic data sets. And that's really important. We force people at Rocket to use realistic data sets on their local development machines with millions of products. Otherwise, you never know uh, and you, you, you think you're fast. But then test. So load tests are easy to do. JUnit is a great system. Um, and we do these tests and really simulate real user behavior and uh, have uh, try to bring our shops down. And not just some test shop, the real shop. You can do that at night. Uh, can do it and monitor all the way to, to the job stops you know, performing and creates errors. And um, that really shows you where are the bottlenecks of your system. And uh, that's, that's really my point. You don't know. You never know where the problem is. And these are all things where we found bottlenecks. It's no joke. We found bottlenecks on the physical link to the data center. Yeah? We found bottlenecks on the firewall. And these were hardware-dedicated F5 firewalls on the load balancer, on the physical network. I had the site almost down because too much traffic on the ethernet. On the hardware, of course, we were able to bring HA proxy down. Um, Memcache was a bottleneck. Solar, Redis, even MongoDB was a bottleneck. Yeah, so, so you don't know. It's not that uh, we, we went out of RabbitMQ connections and things like that. So I think, the, again, uh, test-driven performance optimization, find out where the, where, the, where the area of the problem is. And then once you identify it, go one level deeper and use, of course, uh, if you just do yeah, micro time in PHP, it's already pretty good. Yeah, we use New Relic, which helps you a lot to do profiling. There's XH prof from Facebook to do uh, Facebook uh, PHP profiling. Lots of tools at your hands to really find the hot spots because it always is 1% of the code creates you know 100% 90% of the of the load. So find those spots and only optimize them. Yeah, only find fix what's broken. On MySQL, use uh, Percona tools to find the queries, not the one that is the slowest, but the aggregated, uh, the, uh, the product of time and number of queries and fix them. And of course, index will help you there. So just to give you some ideas what Rocket has to handle on PHP servers, it's currently like, that, that doesn't include Zalando, uh, like 5,000 orders per minute or 200,000 requests per minute. Or um, in, uh, in one instance, 300,000 database writes per, per second, actually. So these are some numbers which 
we faced, and you might maybe face if you grow up. Yeah? <laughs> I don't know which size you are. Of course, if you're in gaming, um, you probably have much more interesting numbers, but that was what we had to handle and we can handle. So that was my first part. And let's just move on and say, once your code is fast, that doesn't matter. Yeah? After your code is fast, what does the customer think about? He, he, he doesn't care. He just wants fast web pages, and he wants fast loading web pages. And we are extremely um, concerned about that and, and fight with this every day because we are in countries with shitty network infrastructure, in Philippines, Indonesia, and so on. And everyone is using mobile phones with bad carriers, with uh, worst case connections. And uh, so we got pretty good at building fast web pages, and I wanted to share some learnings there. And the first step, if you want to know how fast your page is, don't use you know, uh, your own machine or web page, page test.org because it's just one sample. What you need to know is, in the infrastructure of your user, how fast is it? So New Relic, for example, is a good tool, but there are others to do in-app, in-page, in, in the browser user testing. And we measure actually every single request from every web user on every device and every um, company worldwide. And then we compare and see how fast they are on average. This measures on load pages at times. And um, without this knowledge, you can't optimize. And then just wanted to show you a little demo of how that works, because after we measure that, we don't stop there, but put it in a pretty cool system, which we built in-house here. Um, try to increase the size a bit. Um, so live, yeah, this is really times from all our companies. And if you, if you scroll down there, there are hundreds. So many sites from Rocket, yeah? 75 companies, but they have a lot of sites worldwide. And the great thing is, yeah, you can go by calendar week and sort it and see the fastest and the slowest. And not only that, you can compare. So let's maybe look at Philippines. I talked about it. So pretty bad, yeah? So eight seconds today in uh, Lamudi, five seconds in Salora in Philippines. And that helps us to see, you know, don't tell me it's the network. If Salora with a very similar uh, website uh, can do five seconds, you should be able to do that. It also, of course, gives us statistics about the past, um, so we can uh, sh see if something goes wrong over time. Oh, uh, the up is this month, the lower one is this uh, last half year. And um, extremely helpful tool for us to see really what's going on at any time. And um, now you would say maybe we, are, we suck at page speed because it's eight seconds, but we really tried hard. Yeah? It's, it's Philippines. I don't know if you've been there. It's, it's just, and to uh, prove that I'm not joking here is look at Hong Kong. The exact same page takes 2.9 seconds, which takes 7.5 in Indonesia. Uh, exact, there's absolutely no difference between the pages, just the network. So what I wanted to show, you know, we, we, we know a bit about page speed, so what do we learn? Actually, we learned that measuring this real, the, the real user load time of a page doesn't help you that much. Yeah, you just know you're slow, but you don't know why. And again, if you do your, your testing, you don't know what part of the page is really slow on the user side. So we went one level deeper and used the Chrome navigation timing API, which is super handy, um, to which times every little asset on the page, every JavaScript and so on, and tells you how fast it is, how long it took. So we have this code running on all the sites. It only works on Chrome, but it also works on Android devices. And then basically measure on the site um, how long it takes to load assets. So let me show you the results here. Um, this is one of our sites. Yeah, I can increase it a bit. So. I sorted the whole thing not by what's the slowest asset, but what's the sum of loads times load time, because that's the maximum, you know, how much users wait in total. So I don't know if anyone is working here. Double click. Nobody? Too bad, yeah, you suck. <laughs> Double click kills our web performance, in this case in Nigeria, yeah? Why? I don't know. They just have bad internet connection. They serve it from Palo Alto, probably, to, to, to Nigeria. Um, and, yeah, and we use double click, unfortunately, on the site for, for showing ads. And the poor user, on average, across six million loads here, had to wait 1.7 seconds for this, for every little picture there. And it's all the top things here is double click. There's another double click. And there's Google Analytics, which is also sucks. And then <laughs> no, just kidding. 
Um, but then you go down and you find your own CMS stuff, which is also actually pretty bad with 1.4 seconds for a little service return icon. So again, by measuring deep, 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 you, you can optimize what's the problem and not just do generic optimizations. If you go further, you find another horrible things. Here, 13, 13 seconds to load anything from S3 post imc.org. Yeah, some, some content guys uploaded external content on the site, and it kills performance because bad CDN and so on. OK, that's about measuring. And then if you measure and then optimize, you can really do great things. This is Food Panda, And they optimized their front end, relaunched it for speed. And you saw how it jumped here, I think, in India from eight seconds to four seconds. So great success there. And they could really see much, much better conversion rate based on that. Of course, we don't do this for fun, but to make <laughs> great user experience and good, good conversion rates. Or La Moda here, which improved the way they use tracking on the site, and suddenly see a big jump in page speed. And now they are on par with uh, Zalora and Lazada in, in Singapore. Or last one, or even small improvements. Zalora changed the CDN in Philippines to a local provider. And that is this one jump over there where they could get down in, in, in one day by uh, by a whole second on the side. Um, if we have a minute, yeah. Let's, but I mean, if you don't have all these tools, you have still Chrome. Chrome is, is pretty powerful on showing you what, uh, what's the problem on your side. Um, so any, any website anyone is running here? <laughs> Let's have a look. Which one? About you? Dot com, or what is it? Uh, that kind of about you. This one? D. That's a bit boring. OK. So just wanted to show you a little. Yeah, yeah, that's nice. Um, just a few tricks how to, to, to analyze that. So, first of all, uh, disable your cache here. Can I make it bigger? No, not really. Um, so, that doesn't count. And then, in the end, it's so easy to just look into your uh, reload. Um, and you have all the assets, and you can sort them easily by, by types of assets. So maybe let's look at the style sheets. Um, so not bad, because it's already minimized, and it's combined. So some sites have a lot of style sheets which are not minimized and combined. Same should be the case for JavaScript. So here we see, whoa, a lot of JavaScript, and many are not, not combined. So of course, you should try to, to get less. Uh, but they are on a CDN, which is a good, OK. And then the red line is the crucial ones. What do you do after the red line doesn't really f hurt your, um, your user experience. So we try to move as much of this external tracking to after onload. That's not enough to do asynchronously, because if you put your scripts as async, they still load before onload. You have to force them to only get triggered, ideally by Google Tech Manager, after, after the onload. Lots of fonts. But then also, if you just look at the documents, you can look at the size. That's OK here. Style sheet size is awesome. Ah, there we have an interesting one. So this main CSS here, half a, half a megabyte. So it turns out that um, even if it's all minimized and, and uh, cached the right way, especially on mobile devices or especially on slow mobile devices, it takes yeah, a lot of time to, to first unzip all this. And then, <laughs> and then pass it every time you part load on every single page load. So what we learned is really by reducing the, the CSS and JavaScript, uh, we could get one second better page load times, um, just by reducing the CPU load on your browser, especially on mobile. Often there's a lot of stuff you don't really use anymore. It's old, deprecated things. So that, that would be an advice here. On the images, of course, the typical thing, make sure they're cached there from a CDN and they are not too big, and they are compressed wide. So maybe, yeah, just to show you, just by doing this, you find typically 90% of the problems already. And of course, you can look into the cache headers um, easily and find out if they are, how long they are out there. Uh, yeah, that's good. So, so you should cache your, your JavaScript and CSS basically forever on the page and add a little uh, number, which is increased every time you do a deploy or so, um, or you change the CSS. There are tools like. Um, aesthetic or so, who can help you. So what do you have to do to get fast pages? Do the basics. You can all read them on Google. Google PageSpeed, great resources, great tools to test. Uh, web page uh, web page test org is a great tool. But then move your tracking to after onload. It really slows down the site. Um, reduce JavaScript CSS side, as I talked about. And then what we did as a next step is really lazy load everything after below the fold. So you 
order, the way you load your page to the order, the user is re uh, reading it. And uh, this footer, or even the menu you see, you unfold, you can do it after onload. So uh, that the onload uh, um, amount of data you need to transfer is, is minimized. And what we also don't do is, um, interestingly, is uh, responsive design. So I know many people love responsive design. We don't do it because it basically forces you to put both versions of the site into one JavaScript and CSS. And that doesn't allow you to optimize really for mobile. So we really think if you're true about mobile first, let's do a mobile design. Yeah? And of course, it's easier to maintain just one design, but it also allows you to do really different things on the mobile side, less assets, less content, and most important, less CSS and JavaScript. Yeah. So that was about getting your page fast. So we have fast code, fast web pages, but let's also talk about how to get a fast team. Yeah? So this is a team from Facebook, and I liked how they got them fast. They said, until your um, code speed optimization goals are not reached, you're not allowed to shave. So <laughs> the guys finally shaved on this picture. That might be a solution to get, you know, in, in, get your team faster. Another one is, um, or maybe I think the, the, the only problem you have with uh, uh, teams is, is this curve. I think everyone who has worked on software has seen that or felt that. You start like amazing speed in a small team and, and, and uh, features are uh, uh, being created by the second. And then after half a year after a year, you, you slide down this curve of productivity. And the thing is, it doesn't help if you add more people. It doesn't help if people work 12 hours, because if you're going asymptotically to zero with your productivity, uh, that doesn't make you faster. So I think the, the, the next piece of my talk is just about how do we avoid sliding down this curve? Uh, we can't probably get at 100%, but there are different things we can do to try to keep um, high on the productivity over time. So why do we get so slow? I think it's mostly about complexity. Uh, over time, your product gets complex, your site gets complex, your code, everything gets complex. And of course, we see that every day. Yeah? Teams grow, architecture grows, more countries, more requirements, more taxes, more legal, more whatever. Um, so my goal is to fight complexity every day. And let's fight it on different levels. First of all, on the code level. Complex code brings you down there. So yeah, this is true production code, and I'm pretty ashamed of it. Uh, <laughs> The guy isn't with us anymore. Uh, <laughs> what happens here? Yeah, you take a substring of something, and then you put it into like some nested arrays, and there's another substring. So impossible. And the guy didn't want to hurt us. He had good intentions. He just didn't, you know. Uh, yeah, I don't know. He didn't know. So what does he need to know? I think he needs to know how to write clean code. And who knows this guy? Anyone? Very good. It's the inventor of the C++ language, great guy. And he's smart. And learn from these smart people and, and read their books, because they say really the, the, the good things. It's from clean code here. I like code to be elegant and efficient. The logic could be, should be straightforward to make it hard for bugs to hide, and so on. Minimal dependencies, ease of maintenance. And clean code does one thing well, you know, not try to do many things. If you're a good co I think some people need to learn this, and they're books, yeah? so make them read the book and uh, teach them. That's what we do at Rocket, at least. Um, clean code is, of course, also a process. We do ongoing refactoring, because in the beginning, you never hit it. You need to keep you know, changing your system to fit to the requirements and cut everything out that is not used and is not needed anymore. We do a lot of code reviews. We use GitHub with pull requests and basically make sure every line of code someone looks at so no one can hide these lines anymore. Um, we do pair programming, not extensively, but I think it's a great tool to, to make people learn and learn best practices, learn the tricks, the code, and learn the younger guys from the older ones. We do, of course, unit testing, and, and we do training. And I think everyone, that's just what you need to keep your code. To keep your, and, and put this as a culture. I mean, put this in the bathroom, huh? so everyone has to read it every day when he goes there. Or, um, yeah, just make sure it's an important priority from, from you as a, as a lead of development. So we fight complexity on the code level, um, but we also do one more thing. What's this? It's a cross-functional team. Yeah? <laughs> so. 
of course, on the organizational level, you can also add a lot of layers of com complexity. What I really don't advise anyone is to build organizations by layers. Yeah? Front end, back end, database engineers, QA guys, product managers, all in different areas, because then they all wait for each other. And that adds complexity and slows you down. So what we do is cross-functional teams, and I really believe in putting everyone on one table, you need to get a thing done. Uh, that is uh, not your only your coders, your, um, they are front end, back end in one person, uh, yeah, full stack developers, then there's uh, the app developer, the product manager, the QA, the DevOps guy, all on one table. And that really keeps this, what you have as a small startup, to carry that on to a large company. Of course, then you have all these cross-functional teams running around, and um, if you have this, who knows what that is? A monolith. Huh? If you have this as your code architecture, it gets hard at, uh, at a point, yeah? because then they get in each other's way, they can't deploy because they depend, and it gets very hard to maintain. So what people invented is um, microservices. Looks then like this, the monolith. Also a bit tricky to handle. Yeah? Many, many different services, different languages of data, databases, all talking to each other. Um, I'm pretty scared of these services because I see in practice how hard, how much time you spend on managing APIs, uh, synchronizing data, and on all the problems you get if you if you cut down your monolith. But you need to go there, otherwise you can't scale your team at some point. You can't use this cross-functional teams like at Spotify, who really focus on one piece of the site. And um, but you need to be smart about it and limit your interactions between the systems and mainly don't. Overdo it. Yeah? Don't don't put everything in a service. If you, my rule is only if the team grows, I split up the services. So I try to be smart. This is like our shop system, and yeah, still our our backend is is pretty monolithic because one a bit bigger team can handle it or two teams. But I think the next step is cutting out the catalog. But of course, our warehouse system is a separate service. Our our ERP, our data warehouse, our campaign management, our and our marketing optimization tools, our front end, and, and that really helps to, um, to split the team up and, and try to minimize the connections. If you start seeing a lot of you know, lines between the two pieces, you made a mistake. Um, that's the organization. Another piece is the process. How do you keep an agile, fast process? Probably almost everyone is doing agile now. What we do is Kanban, and what I think is great in Kanban is that you limit the work in progress, you limit the stuff you have to have in your head, yeah? because you get everything out that's done. You don't wait for a sprint end to release. And we really try to release very often, ideally once a day, or even more often. That's one thing. And again, it reduces complexity because less working memory is needed in the developers and product managers head. But also, I really like tangible, visible progress. Yeah, this is a very simple example of a, of a task card we put on the board. You know, who is responsible for this? What's the Jira ticket? How much did he estimate? What is his remaining estimate every day? You can use it in your stand-up meeting. You can really work with this and move it around, and it's everyone in the peripheral vision. So I think that is also helps you to, to, uh, um, to keep everything, everyone aligned on the team in a, in a good way. And finally, um, if you want to fight complexity, you need to learn how to, how to say no. Yeah? <laughs> and uh, because simple is beautiful, and that is, uh, of course, not only on code level, where it's also important to say no. Say no to people who want to use all kinds of databases, or say no to people who think I see sometimes uh, senior developers who want to use patterns for everything and think they are not a good developer if they don't use uh, factories and adapters and so on for them. But it, it increases complexity. You have more classes to manage, it's harder to read. Um, so I like junior developers who see a problem and they know, you know a solution and they just go straight. Uh, they don't, uh, are not spoiled by too many patterns yet. Um, <laughs> but still um, having some seniors around to help them not to make stupid mistakes is helpful. Um, that's the code level, but it's also the product side. How do you keep your product simple? I mean, all your product managers, they use MacBooks, and they're so nice and simple, and then they come up with millions of ideas. <laughs> uh, how the, these five things really are needed to make your product succeed. So I, you know, as a tech guy, I tend to say no all the time. I, my rule is say three times no before you say yes, no matter what it is, because half of the things don't come back after the second no. So, ah, okay, we removed already half of the stuff. It keeps your architecture more simple and, and avoids getting all this stuff in there. 
Simple is beautiful. The less you do, the less complexity, the higher you stay up on this slope of productivity. And that is the piece on how to get high-performance teams. So for me, it's not about you know, money and bonus and time. It's really about fighting complexity to, to keep the team as performant as it was in the beginning. Last part is on the whole organization. Yeah, that what, what is Rakik doing? What's our secret yeah, to get so many sites out? This is real numbers. It's public. Huh? Um, how many sites we do per month? So there in uh, this year, we did 16 different country sites just in one month. Um, and I think that shows we are, we are a fast organization. We can get a lot of things done in parallel. And how do we do this? Uh, there are a lot of pieces that come together, but maybe let me mention two, three things that I think are important. One really, really important concept is the time box. Huh? So the interesting thing is we do a new project. We don't do much planning. We don't do estimations. But still, we set a launch date. So, and usually, it's the same launch date no matter what we do. Huh? It's an interesting concept. Typically, it's three months from now. Um, how can that work? Yeah? If we build a bank, three months. If it's uh, like a Groupon, it's three months. Uh, it's a big difference between that. But I think the trick is, yeah, if your time is fixed and your scope, uh, sorry, your, your team is more or less fixed, the quality would never change. Then what do you change? You change the scope, of course. And you just cut everything out that doesn't fit into the box. And that helps you to be fast. That helps you to focus on the important stuff. And if we say we have three months, that really helps the whole organization to focus on this goal and, and cut out the crap. Um, this sounds a bit like minimum viable product, but I would say I don't want to launch minimum products. I want to launch real good, you know, great products. So where do we cut? Not so much on the front end, on the user side, but we cut a lot on the back end. Because for the launch, yeah, who cares what's going on in the back end? You don't see it. So we often yeah, do more like a facade thing to get running. And in the back, yeah, Google Docs can handle the first three months. And uh, then you have time to build the back. And the, the great thing is you learn a lot by that. Yeah? You learn how your customers behave, what kind of, how orders work. And um, we were able to get Google Docs down yeah, with this approach <laughs> at the point where Google Docs couldn't handle our load anymore. But uh, yeah, then we built our system, but not too early. And that, that really helps by this time boxing to, to f get your organization to, to cut the crap. Um, the other piece is uh, very related is you ain't going to need it. Yeah? And that is not only features, but I think it's also as an organizational principle or a code, but it's you know, try, if, you, if you try to be fast, it, it helps you to um, stop things that don't really lead you to the goal. And that is at Rocket, you know, meetings and mails and, and uh, planning and all these overhead things we try to minimize as much as possible so people really work on getting one step closer to the launch every day and not, you know, plan ahead too much. If we would have, you know, 40 days to launch and spend 20 days planning how to launch, uh, we, we will not do it. Um, so that's really our organizational principle to, to keep things extremely lean and uh, flat. And, and it's actually fun because you feel more productive like that. Mm -hmm. But another piece is, of course, and that's a bit more specific to Rocket, that we build platforms, not products, so we can reuse things. I think that also in other contexts is a good concept that you say, let's reuse, plug things together, use the same you know, external partners, uh, use the same new relic everywhere so we can really um, uh, learn from one project to the next. And that we do in a sh shared code base. So that also helps to be fast because um, you don't reinvent the wheel every time. Um, so there's one team that supports sometimes 50 countries centrally. And in Berlin, there's a, all companies agree on a shared pro code map. and. Uh, so we can um, yeah, get, get rather really smart, good guys and let them do things that scale, then do it 10 times half good. And finally, yeah, I really love this matrix of how to stay focused. Um, it's about not doing yeah, what is important, uh, urgent and not important. It's about doing what's important and not urgent. It's about really... Uh, yeah, yeah. read it yourself. <laughs> um, but I think if you do this every day, and if you start the day, think for yourself, 
what today is important, uh, and the urgent stuff you have to do. If your server's down, there's no way around it. But there's so much urgent, not important stuff, and that really, that for me is waste, and minimizing that, I think the best example is mail. Our, our CEO said, don't write mails during the day. I think that's a good rule. Yeah? <laughs> uh, it's pretty radical, but he says, you can do this in the evening on the taxi or whatever. Yeah? Um, but not only stay focused, but also keep shipping. Uh, that's, I think, what Mark Zuckerberg has on his desk. Um, I think if you have this, this idea of, of get a little thing out every day, move forward for the customer, and, and uh, that, that keeps your whole organization focused on, on creating value. And if you do this all together, you're fast, and if you're fast, you can get big. And uh, that's the size we reached at Rocket so far. Four, what is it, trillion visits to all our sites, so we are pretty proud of that. And uh, I hope that was some helpful insights. We have a few minutes left. If you have questions, happy to answer. Anyone? And yes. I have a question. Actually, um, <clears throat> I've s uh, in the new relic a chart for Food Panda. Yeah. When you showed the picture uh, yeah. that you brought down the, yeah. the load time, uh, did I see it right that the up server execution time went actually up, but the total um, uh, loading time went down because I, I think yeah, this is very important because, yeah. mm -hmm. because it could be that mm -hmm. uh, many people just focus on app server execution time but forget yeah. what, what actually ends uh, yeah. at the user. I don't know we could look at it, but it's probably true. I think app server execution time doesn't make such a big difference. Yeah, Your typically app server will deliver a page in 200 milliseconds, so if you get that down to 150, user won't notice. It's, uh, the user is, for me, a web page is loaded when the thing stops spinning. Yeah? That's when the browser tells the user we're done, and that is when the onload event is fired, so but, uh, their new relic or on-site tracking can really help you to find that. And yes, that's what they did probably, because they switched to Symfony, they have more time on the app server to spend, but they really focused on reducing CSS, JavaScript, and uh, lazy loading that brought the experienced load time down. Yeah. Anything else? No more questions. Ah, there's one. OK. Can you share, can you share some info about influence of uh, page speed uh, on conversion rate? Maybe there are some uh, white papers from Amazon about 1% per 100 milliseconds. Uh, do you have some info? It's pretty hard to do a, do a clear correlation there because always a lot of things change. But preliminary data in this Food Panda case shows that they got 25% up with this step. So by half, getting four seconds better, they could improve by 25%. I don't know if this is long term, yeah, but that was uh, what I heard. Yeah. And it's, um, these numbers I also know. It's, I mean, in the end, you could test. You could give some of your users slow pages and see what happens. <laughs> Hello. Mm -hmm. uh, you. Yes. Hi. Mm -hmm. You previously said that you were mocking the back end in the beginning for some companies. Yeah. Uh, was it the same with Zalando? It's a pretty popular example, but maybe you can give some insight on that. I wasn't around when they started Zalando, so um, I, I don't think so. They started it lean. Yeah, they, had, they didn't know it got, got this big. Um, they started with Magento, actually. So really simple. Just took some existing tool and uh, then uh, replace it step by step, first the front end, then the back end. But again, it's, I think, also a similar approach to say, let's use something that we can roll out extremely fast, like a proven tool, and then worry about scalability later. Um, so that, that's how they got started quickly. So also they got uh, the same back end like some other companies which you have? Um, when we built the second Zalando that was Dafici, um, we, we rebuilt Zalando's on Java, we rebuilt the whole thing in PHP, and uh, all the other companies are now on the same system. So that's our internal shop system, which is now powering all the non Zalando uh, rocket uh, e commerce sites. Yeah. Thanks. Mm -hmm. um, how do you avoid getting slowed down by compliance issues? It comes pretty late, typically. <laughs> so when you have these problems, uh, you're, you're well, yeah, yeah, if, you, if you have to worry about IPO compliance and so on. Um, oh. 
hey, you got to do it, uh, but also you don't have to overdo it. I think they, these PVCs of the world, they have their checklist and you need to make sure they get a, a check mark on it, PWCs. Um, but of course, you need to do it. There's no way around it. But it's also not so hard. I think what, what helps us is that we typically set up the systems on a pretty good uh, initial standard by reusing the same puppet, the same uh, server architecture, so it's already uh, security issues and so on are quite, quite well done. Yeah. And um, by the way, I also don't think you should f do everything crappy in the beginning and replace it and do it five times. I think doing things right in the beginning is a good, good thing. It's often so much more uh, cheap in the beginning than later, so that's why you need experienced guy who already know in the beginning what what will come. But uh, um, and these compliance things are part of that. That how you make a secure architecture, for example. So yeah. If you would be able now to forget what you have and rebuild everything from scratch, uh, what technologies you will leave uh, and what would you change from the old stack that was developed um, till now? I think PHP is good for us. I, I wouldn't change. Uh, I wouldn't change MySQL. It's great. Okay, yeah. uh, Perfor, uh, uh, I think I would do the whole catalog in, in MongoDB or Elasticsearch as a, as a really document-oriented database. I think Solar is a great tool for search or Elasticsearch. I think we are not so bad with the systems we use. They, they carry us quite well from small to big. I think I would do a cloud-based architecture, not, not uh, own hosting nowadays. Uh, sorry? How do you keep um, uh, code complexity low um, while at the same time supporting local features, mm -hmm. uh, adaptions, adapting to the market because you're doing worldwide? Mm -hmm. I guess other people want different things. Um, depends. For e-commerce, we decided to branch and uh, because it was too hard to get everything on one, one system, so many local requirements and uh, then have updates to the system a bit like you know a magento update which is painful but it is the best way i think you need it's a fine balance where you centralize and say we keep everything run on the same code and then you can do feature switches uh, but really force everyone to use exactly the same version um, wherever i can do that i would do it because you know if everyone would start branching mysql you you end up in hell yeah, it's uh, but for some cases, it's too hard. But if you take a food panda in 40 countries, two trees or so, they are all using exactly the same code by feature switches and deploy every day to all the countries. I think that's really important. Mm -hmm. Yep. Maybe just shout, I repeat. Oh, no, there it's coming. Um, the Google Chrome uh, timing API mm -hmm. Uh, how do you do not to slow down the clients by it? And how do you do to store so much data and don't uh, slow good, down your servers? Good point. You, you wait till on load, and then the whole page is loaded before you trigger this, uh, the whole script. Um, it just attaches to the unload event. And it doesn't hurt page load times. And uh, we use for this pretty advanced uh, Lua inside Nginx. It's a pretty fast uh, solution, and that writes directly from there to Redis. And that works well. Mm -hmm. Anything else? Noch eine Frage da oben. So for such things, I, yeah, of course it's great to use Golang on new tools. I just uh, wouldn't re write my whole shop in it. Uh, yeah. Uh, hi, you use uh, for tracking events or user-based mm -hmm. things like uh, page views or mm -hmm. whatever to analyze and uh, improve your system, you do something else or not like Google Analytics, you have an own build system? 90, 95% Google Analytics, it's like the premium is so powerful nowadays, you, uh, that, that works. Um, but we also use own tracking and then directly put the, the events into Elasticsearch and to do, for example, recommendations based on that. Uh, that's pretty recent, uh, not on all systems. Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay, what's the time? Yeah, I still have time, yeah? Over there? I'm a bit conflicted. Um, you're talking about time boxing, doing things fast, mm -hmm. and you're talking about doing things right. Mm -hmm. How do you make the decision? 
What are you doing fast? What Experience. are you doing right? Yeah, it's just uh, just that I think. <laughs> so so get get some some smart, some smart guy on top who who takes these decisions for you. Um. <laughs> Not me, no. <laughs> Lars is smart also. Okay. Then I think, thank you very much for your attention. It was a pleasure. And of course, if you want to work in Berlin and do PHP, you're welcome. Eh? Mm -hmm. Talk to me. All right.